Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't think we lost anybody. (laughs) I figured we'd lose half of them, you know. (laughs) The pretty part of the family has already gotten been up here. (laughs) My name is Chuck Spee, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) Hi. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I'm in my 37th year without a drink or a pill of any kind. Due to the fact that uh, there's a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, and there are people like you. who share their experience, strength, and hope with people like me. It's been no chore for me to be around here for 36 and a half years. This is the only easy life I have ever known. The only good life that's ever been mine. And I hope I have another 36 years. And I think it will. You don't think so, huh? (laughs) He looks like he was mad at me. (laughs) He's not mad at me. I think he uh, delivers Miller's light beer. (laughs) <laughs> and he don't want to despoil his sales. <laughs> I feel like a clown. <laughs> You're in the right place. I've had a little trouble breathing the last few years. I don't think it had anything at all to do with the fact that I smoked four packs of camels for many years every day. (laughs) They told me about 20 years ago that I could either smoke or breathe. And I chose breathing. (laughs) But this thing didn't catch up with me until about four or five years ago. And uh, their prognosis is glum. They tell me that there's no reversing lung damage. So that was not acceptable. So I uh, took a good look at myself, and I said to me, any power that could keep me from wanting a drink for 36 years, a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot drunk like me, I haven't even had one conscious desire for a drink since I got here. And I said to me, any power that could do that, this thing's peanuts. (laughs) so I'm going to get well and I've been getting well ever since I don't know uh, as I'm going to to continue because uh, in July uh, I'm supposed to (laughs) just kill you 
I'm supposed to talk to the doctors at Hogue Hospital at lunch. And then the, I get through with that, and then I'm talking to the patients. The doctors only get 30 minutes, but the patient's supposed to get an hour and a half. <laughs> Now, I don't know why I ever accept that kind of commitment. What the hell am I going to take a bu tell a bunch of doctors? Huh? They probably all need this program. I... <laughs> My own doctor, who is quite an expert in... Uh, chest problems told me after he'd been treating me for a couple of years that he would treat me and not charge me and I'd treat him and not charge him <laughs> I said I can't do that you have a license that gives you a right to charge. I ain't got no license. So you treat me and charge me, and I'll treat you and not charge you. Because uh, when I talk, I have to call them as I see them, even in this leper colony of ours. And I can't uh, take an honorarium. Sometimes I get an assignment that has pretty good uh, stipend for uh, honorarium. But I can't take it. Because I figure that if they paid me, I would have to say what I think they want me to say. And I can't talk that way. <laughs> So, I'm not charging you for this deal tonight. <laughs> I wanted to when I saw this crowd. <laughs> and most of you look like you had money. <laughs> I've been conditioned to believe that all Texans have a large bankroll because they're sitting on an oil well. That's what they're doing. But I uh, will be happy just to get my car fare. I don't want to. I don't want to leave uh, owing myself money. <laughs> In an hour's time, I can't tell you much about my drinking career other than this. That I had to die to get here. In the first 43 years of my life, I never made a mistake. <laughs> I always had some place to point the finger. It was never my fault. It was your fault. It was conditions. It was circumstances. It was the rotten society in which I was born. It was my wife's fault. And as good a, as, good an excuse for drinking as she was, <laughs> she couldn't hold a candle to her mother. <laughs> mother lived with us for the last five years that I drank. 
And she had a grandstand seat <laughs> watching me crucify her only daughter. And she didn't like me very good. And I didn't like her that good. <laughs> because if she hadn't been living with us, I wouldn't have had to crucify her daughter. It was her fault. All the way through. She lived with us five years after I sobered up. And I could spend this evening beautifully telling you what this program did for her. <laughs> Have you ever saw an old bag straighten up and fly right? It was her mother. <laughs> and she never attended one AA meeting. She used to just embarrass me to death because she wouldn't believe that you people had been any, uh, any help to me. She wouldn't believe that God had been any help. She would come up and put her arms around me and she'd say, Oh, son, I always knew that you had it in you. <laughs> well, I did too, but I wasn't thinking of the same thing she was. And I want to tell you something. I wrote this thing right through the gates of insanity and death. I'll tell you a little about my last go-round. It started on the Friday before Christmas, 1945. And I just got a note from a chap that called himself my brunette son. He's... Uh, a little darker than I am, so uh, he's brunette all right. And uh, he sent me a uh, thing that gave me the date on which the Friday before Christmas fell in 1945, and it was the 21st of December. So I had 10 days in December and 18 days in January that I lost. I don't remember anything about it at all. Nothing. I don't remember the first drink, the middle drink, or the last drink. Don't remember anything. Now that lady that you just heard talk says that during all that time, I destroyed seven quarts of whiskey every three days. And I can't even argue with her. <laughs> because I wasn't there. <laughs> she was. And I just have to keep my mouth shut. And that's one reason. The next reason is, I don't think seven quarts is too much for three days. <laughs> If you only work at it, maybe 15 days. But if you go 28 days, it's either too much or just enough. And in my case, it was just enough. Because I came to after the middle of January 1946 with the clearest head I had ever had in my life. Because all of my excuses and all my I wants burned out in that 28 days. I did not surrender consciously. I had nothing to do with it. I can't even say to you tonight, well, I drank the whiskey, didn't I? And that's what burned them out, but I don't remember drinking the whiskey. So I can't even say that. I think if I could remember anything at all about that deal, I could figure out a way to take credit <laughs> for the last 36 years. But I can't remember. I can't even say, well, I drank the whiskey, didn't I? Because I don't know. But when I came to, my excuses were gone and my I wants were gone 
And I saw me for the first time in my life with nothing between me and me. And for the first time in my life, I admitted defeat. I had not one time in, in 43 years admitted defeat. I could not admit defeat. I had an older brother, three and a half years older than I, and three and a half years stronger. And we had one fight that lasted 20 years on the installment plan. <laughs> and he beat the bejesus out of me for 20 years straight. But he couldn't make me believe it. I left home at 20, believing I could whip him. And he had whipped me for 20 years straight. I became a periodic 11 years before coming to this program because I was not going to lose to a bottle. No way. So I became periodic. And for 11 years, I was as dry as I am tonight between every two drunks. But I always got drunk again. So, I could not admit defeat. And fortunately for me, and I believe it to be, the most fortunate single experience in my life, sometime between the Friday before Christmas and the middle of January, The ego and the excuses all burned up, burned out. And I could look at me and see that I'd lost the battle of life. I did not know why, because I knew nothing of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> nothing at all. I didn't know anything about the disease of alcoholism. I knew an awful lot about the inside of jails. I knew a lot about the DTs and the convulsions and very dirty beds. But I didn't know anything about alcoholism. And so, fortunately for me, the second great good fortune was that after I'd been looking at this thing a little while, the morning I came to, I remembered that Mrs. C. had found Jack Alexander's article in the Saturday Evening Post, March 1st, issue 1941. She had read it, thought it might help me if I read it. So she put it on the left arm of the chair I sit in today, open at the right place, hoping that when I came in, if I came in, I'd read it. And evidently I did. But I never remembered the thing about it until that morning. And I remembered that I'd read it. Remembered only two things about it. Drunks help drunks. And didn't drink. And they called it Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said to myself, if I ever live to get out of this bed, I will find Alcoholics Anonymous. And immediately, the curtain dropped, and I was sick to death, drunk, and insane. And I had a lot of dying to do. But from the moment of commitment until right now, I have never had a drink or a sedating or tranquilizing pill of any kind. Such is the great significance of this thing called surrender. Surrender. This is a battle we win by giving up the fight. In my opinion, one of the greatest lines in our book is we cease to fight anything or anybody. Because that's what happened to me. And I haven't had a drink or a pill since. And furthermore, and this I get a lot of repercussions over,
My first group was Beverly Hills group because that's where we lived. And when I'd get up before my group and tell them that I never had a, a conscious desire for a drink since my first appearance with you guys, half of it hit the floor. And they would say something that you shouldn't say in church. They'd say, Chuck, you're a goddamn liar. That's what they'd say. <laughs> in chorus. Because they were having trouble, most of them, uh, hanging on to not drinking. We call it white knuckles, sobriety. I've never had any since I came to you. My 11 years trying to keep from drinking and get off the stuff to get well enough to get back in the ring for the next round. I had white knuckle sobriety then, or not sobriety, but dryness. I think we use the term sobriety too loosely amongst us. My definition of sobriety is the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with myself. Because, in my opinion, alcoholism is not caused by drinking alcohol. Alcoholism is a living problem. And you and I have to have a living answer, lest we drink again. For instance, insofar as I am able to perceive, there is only one reason that I'm not drunk right now. Just one, not two. Just one. And the reason is I've got the thing I was looking for in the bottle. I've got it. And what's the thing? It's the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with me. And having that ability, I don't have the slightest difficulty living with you. <coughs> Even the meatheads sitting here. Like... <laughs> Some of you I've known for quite a while. <laughs> On me. <laughs> I don't have any trouble living with you. I've had the privilege in the last 36 years of talking in many, many, many penitentiaries in different parts of the world. And I don't have any trouble there. I don't have a bit of trouble. It's, it's not, the problem isn't out there. Our problem is inside. And I believe that every uh, society that we have allowed to use our program is a living problem, just the same. I don't think Fat is Anonymous is uh, an eating problem. Some of these days when I'm going to bounce a steel chair off my forehead. <laughs> because they've been trying now for years to get me to say, Overeaters Anonymous. <laughs> that don't mean nothing to me. Fatty's Anonymous has a real ring. <laughs> Gamblers Anonymous. I'm a gambler, always was, and loved to gamble. But I'm not a compulsive gambler. I sort of grew up in the South, and the blacks taught me how to gamble, and they taught me good. And so I've, I've won a great deal more money than I ever lost gambling. But I don't go out and throw money away. One of the things they taught me, if you win some money, it's not, you're not playing on the house. If you lose it, you ain't got it. And if you win it, they ain't got it. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> so you're gambling with your own money. So don't don't think you're gambling on the house. Put it in your pocket and keep it. 
They taught me never to gamble with scared money. One of my <laughs> wife's bad problems. <laughs> and she can't gamble with, uh, without having scared money. She pays the nickel lock of slot machines and, and condemns herself. <laughs> it's a jackpot and hates it because she's got their money. <laughs> That's not what they taught me. If you win, it's yours. And they taught me not to sit around and try to wait for your luck. If you sit down in the game and your luck's bad, get up and leave. Come back tomorrow. You know, those things are fundamental. But that's not the way the, the compulsive gambler does it. I'm going to tell you a little story. It illustrates this. <clears throat> a few years ago, I got a call on a Friday night from Man and Whittier. We, were, we live in Laguna Beach. And this chap was in Whittier. And he says, Chuck, I'm sitting here with a six gun in my hand and I'm going to blow my brains out. But Jim told me not to shoot myself until I talk to you. <laughs> Now he says, what do you got to say? <laughs> well, I says, you called me on a bad night. <laughs> I says, I'm talking tonight, Saturday night and Sunday night. But I'm open Monday night. <laughs> if you want to talk to me, talk to me Monday night. And he hung up the phone. And I thought that was it. Well, Monday night, about 7.30, the doorbell rang. And I go to the door, and it's my boy from Woodley, will you? And he comes in, and he sits down. And he was a alky and a compulsive gambler. And he lost a lot of money that he didn't have. And he lost it to professional gamblers. And that's not a good way to... <laughs> Establish and maintain longevity. <laughs> and so we sat down there at 7.30 and we started the preamble and at about 2 o'clock we were at step 8. <laughs> and step, step 8 says we made a list of all persons we'd harm and became willing to make amends to them all. And I was getting strung out on that. And I was telling this old boy, now look, you're going to have to go to these people and you're going to have to tell them that you admit the debt, that it's legitimate, you lost the money, and you'll pay it back as soon as you can. But you ain't got no money now. Yeah, Chuck, he says I can't do that. They'll kill me. <laughs> I said, so what? You won't have suicide on your mind. <laughs> and he started to laugh. <laughs> and he's never quit laughing. <laughs> He has never quit laughing. I, I walked out on the porch and listened to him all the way down the hill, laughing. <laughs> Every time I meet him, he's laughing. <laughs> and he ain't very dead. <laughs> and he's paid off all his bills. And nobody killed him. You see, this, this is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That's the reason I told you. Because until we get rigorously self-honest, we're going to have trouble with this program. we got to learn how to be honest with us before we can think too much about being honest with other people. Rigorous self-honesty is a golden key to this 
life that we find here. Fabulous thing. So I threw that in to make a point, and I won't belabor it. Mrs. C. told you a few times how her life has changed since she has gotten to the place where she can laugh at herself. I had my crying before I got here. Oh, I cry easy now, but it's not for me, uh, you know. I, I cry a lot, and I, when I feel like crying, I cry. I stand up here at these podiums and cry like a damn baby. And it's all right with me, because I don't mind, you know. So, <clears throat> I decided to come to this program, and I didn't know how to find it. I didn't know how to find it. I knew that you wouldn't be in the phone book, <laughs> because you were anonymous, weren't you? <laughs> so knowing you weren't there, I never looked. <laughs> Which is the story of my life. I knew so damn much that it wasn't true, I couldn't learn anything that was. <laughs> so I had to call people and ask them if they knew anybody that knew anybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And from a doctor that had treated me a few, on a few occasions, keeping him from diet, he gave me the name of a man that was a member of our society, motion picture man. And I talked with him, and... Uh, he told me a little about the program. He said, have you had a drink today? And I said, no. Well, he said, don't, don't take one. He says, I have to work tonight, so I can't take you to meeting. But I might not have to work tomorrow night, so call me tomorrow. I called him tomorrow, and we talked a little while, and he said, you had a drink today? And I said, no. Well, he said, don't take one. I, I'm still working. <laughs> call me tomorrow. So I called him the third day, and we hadn't gotten very far into the conversation when I knew he was still working. <laughs> so I said to him, I know you're still working. He says, yeah. I said, you don't have to take me to meeting. Where's the meeting I can go to? And he told me. And I decided to go. And I felt real good about it until about 10 minutes before I was supposed to leave. <laughs> and then I did the, uh, the unforgivable. I started to think. <laughs> now, I came all the way down here to tell you two things. First one is quit thinking. <laughs> this is our problem. Look, and that was our problem. Thinking is our problem. <laughs> if there was ever a bunch of screwball thinkers in the world, it's the alcoholics. <laughs> we can justify anything in the world, including murder. <laughs> you know. So quit thinking. You can live yourself in the right you can live yourself in the right thinking, but you can't think yourself in the right living. I'm totally convinced that you can't find God looking for him. Because what you're looking for, you're looking with. And how are you going to find God out yonder when he ain't out there? Yours isn't. Yours is right there. So you got to turn your eyeballs around. It's an inside job. So... Quit thinking. Get lost in life and find yourself in God. And the second thing is, I've forgotten. <laughs> forgotten. I 
I'll bring this up a little later. <laughs> so, I started to think. And I, my alcoholic mind said to me, Look, son, you've lived in Beverly Hills a long time. And it just might not be good for you to be seen with a bunch of drunks. <laughs> now, you'll never know how funny that is. <laughs> because the only guy in Beverly Hills that spent more time in the Beverly Hills jail than I did was the jailer. <laughs> I killed two chiefs of police in Beverly Hills in about, oh, maybe 15 years' time. You know? I mean, worried him to death. <laughs> so, I was a little bit afraid that it might not be good for my reputation to be seen with you guys. But I talked myself out of it because it was time to do something. And I said to myself, all right, disguise yourself. <laughs> So you won't be immediately recognizable. <laughs> and get to that meeting. And I did. And I went to the meeting. There was a great big hall, big as this one, on the way deep, too. And right in the middle of the back wall, there was an outside door. And it was open. And I came up there and looked in, and there might have been 35 people there. Mind you, this is over 36 years ago. And they were all in the middle of the room, everyone of them talking and nobody listening. <laughs> and it's been that way ever since. <laughs> now, I couldn't hear a word they said, but I could, I could hear the, the mumbling, and it was happy. It was happy talk. I didn't hear their words, but it was happy talk. And I said to myself, they've given me the wrong, the wrong dope. This is the wrong night. This is, these are the veterans and their wives and they're here for a party. Because it was, <laughs> it was the veterans of Foreign Wars Hall where they were having an eating. And I'm going to have to leave and come back tonight to drunks are here. <laughs> and I turned to leave and I was, as near dead as I'll ever be, I guess, because at long last I'd come in the wrong night. <coughs> and here, the next minute, is the very essence of our program. This is the reason it works. When maybe nothing else does, I don't know. <coughs> Somebody in the middle of that room had been watching me. And when I turned to leave, he came running over to the door. And he called after me. And he says, Mister, were you looking for somebody? And I said, No, sir. Well, he says, What were you looking for then? And thinking he was a veteran, I said, Well, if it, if it would interest you, sir. I was looking for Shabai. And everything about that man changed just like that. He just lit up. Lit up just like he'd turned a light on inside him. And here's what he said to me. Why, well, take off your hat and coat, you're in the right place. Well, he didn't know it, but he'd just stolen my <laughs> disguise right there. <laughs> he'd undressed me as well. And so, they took me and rocked me to sleep. I remember that meeting, the first one I ever went to, better than I remember last night's meeting. Everything about that thing I remember. The very first thing they told me, this is if you're an alcoholic, it's the first drink that's killing you. Now, I've been drinking for a lot of years, and it had never occurred to me that it was first drink. I thought it was the last gallon. <laughs> I was trying to knock it off 
before the trouble started, for years. <laughs> and the very first thing you monkey said to me, it's the first drink that's killing you. If you don't take the first drink, you don't take the second one. So, I played with that a little while and bought it, and I still got it. The second thing you told me, and this I wouldn't take all the oil in Texas for. There's a lot of oil down here. I know drunks down here that's got 43 oil wells. <laughs> Might host up the way years ago had an income of ten thousand dollars a day, and he had eight wells that were supposed to come in that weekend. So I wouldn't take the whole whole deal for what you told me the next the, the next time you opened your mouth. You says today is the day we don't drink. Today is the day we don't drink. If you had have told me that I had to stay sober 36 years, I'd have dropped dead. <laughs> if you had have said 36 days, I'd have dropped dead. But you didn't. You said today is the day we don't drink. Now, said you, regardless of how long you live, in Alcoholics Anonymous. Never expand that time more than 24 hours. And you went ahead to tell me that the past is nothing but guilt and the future is nothing but fear. And if you live in the now, you duck them both. Hear me? Right now. Is, the, is our time. This is my day. I have no past. I want no future. And I've lived this way for over 36 years now. And it's a cinch. It's a cinch. If I had to depend on what I read in the papers and what I hear over that insane TV stuff, for my peace of mind and serenity purpose. I wouldn't have any. I wouldn't even finish this talk. <laughs> I'd say, call me an ambulance. I'm going to the hospital. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. And somebody uh, said something about that a long time ago. You know, in another book that we read a little bit once in a while. Now is the only time we'll ever know. <clears throat> right now is eternity. You don't wake up tomorrow morning. You wake up and it's now. And that's the reason it took me so long to get here. Because I'd come to, I never woke up. I'd come to. And I'd have to have a tumbler of liquor. But I wouldn't take it. I'd look at yesterday and I'd see where I made my mistakes. And I would be able to argue myself into the position that today I'm only going to take what I have to to, to to live. Just what I have to to live. And tomorrow I'll wake up and I won't have to take that tumbler of liquor. And when I got it all laid out right, I'd take the tumbler of liquor. And tomorrow I would come to and I still had to have a tumbler of liquor, you know. So, when we live one day at a time, we don't have to do that. <clears throat> Second, second greatest thing I ever learned in my life. This is my day. I have no past. I want no future. The first one 
is not, it don't belong in this position in my yak yak, but I'm going to give it to you, is that uh, if we are going to live without drinking, we have to have some sort of personally acceptable conscious partnership with the living God that made us in the entire business of living. The whole thing, if we're going to live without drinking. Because drinking is a living problem. And the only reason that I'm not drunk right now, I've got the thing I was looking for in the bottle. And it's better than any liquor that I ever had. There's nothing in a bottle, pot, acid, that can do anything to me but tear me down. Because I've got the answer that he's always looking for. And I'll tell you a little about that. <clears throat> As I told you, I didn't come here looking for permanent sobriety for myself. I came here to find out a way to, to not drink right now. So I could use the time rubbing out the record. I didn't want my wife and my kids to remember me as nothing but a tongue-chewing, babbling idiot, drunk. And I came to you to find out how not to drink right now, so I could use that time to rub out. And I stayed because it was comfortable. I knew you monkeys were alcoholics because you were marked up like me. You had headlights here, and you had bags under bags, and your wiring was exposed. <laughs> you know. And I knew you were drunk, but I also knew you weren't drunk because I saw your eyes and I heard your voices. And it was comfortable. And I was back there. I was back there. Every night I was back. Because it was comfortable. Now, I didn't, uh, I, I knew you had something I'd like to have, but I, I didn't expect it. Because I didn't have the right to it. I didn't figure that God owed me anything. You know, that I wasn't entitled to any of his goodies. So I wasn't asking him for anything. But it's back here because it's comfortable. Now this is the series that happened to me. In six months, I discovered that I hadn't had a drink or pill for six months. And hadn't wanted one. Now that ain't bad. For a tongue chewing, babbling idiot drunk, is it? So I got so busy trying to give it away that another six months went by. And I discovered I had a family. And they were living like kittens. And that wasn't a bad discovery. And a year went by. And I discovered that I was still down in the office trying to clean up my desk. And business was good. It was just good. Not a bad discovery. And another year went by. And I discovered that my own state of being was better than anything I'd ever known. It was just the good to breathe in and out. I rediscovered that lately, too. <clears throat> Those are pretty good discoveries. Six years went by, and I discovered I had a God of my very own. Wherever I am, He is. Now, this is the great discovery. This is what I was trying to bring about for 30 years. Straight years, from 13 to 43, and missed on. And what I had given up on six years before, wasn't trying to bring it about at all, and six years went by, and I discovered I had a God of my very own. Wherever I am, he is. And I was so elated over this, that I immediately started to try to figure out how I was going to show my gratitude. And the first thing I decided, 
I was going to build him a plaque. We were in the woodworking business, and I had some of the finest mechanics in the world. He could make anything out of wood and stainless steel and formica and stuff like that. So I'm going to build him a plaque. And I got it designed in my mind, and I finally, before I started him on the project, I said to myself, who are you going to give it to? <laughs> and I could see me handing him this plaque, and he didn't take it. <laughs> and I dropped it on my foot and broke my foot. <laughs> so I had to laugh about that. <laughs> so then I was back to the starting gate. I said, who are you going to give it to? And my second d decision, I was going to become a Trappist monk. <laughs> Now, I knew a lot about the Trappist monks. I'd read a lot about them. I loved them. And I said, I'll just be a Trappist monk. And it hit me. Man, you're not even a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to be a Trappist monk? <laughs> so I had to give that up. <laughs> so I'm back to starting gate again. <clears throat> and this time, I got the answer. And uh, there's a guy called St. Peter. The Catholics think he was the first pope. I don't think so. I won't explain that. But anyway, I call him Old Pete because uh, before he became a saint, I could... Uh, Identify with him a little bit. You know, when he got caught with red handed, he lied out of it. And I said to myself, he's a little bit alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, here uh, I ran up to this little dealie. The carpenter man called old Pete in before he left, and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Pete says, yeah, Lord. He says, tend my sheep. Now, if you're Catholic, he said, tend my lambs, but I'm not Catholic. So he said, tend my sheep, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I happen to be looking at ex an ex-nun, so uh, I'm having a little fun out of her as I go along. Hi. Anyway, <clears throat> Pete says, Peter de Lemon, he says, yeah, Lord, tend my sheep. And he turned right around and said to him again, Peter de Lemon, yeah, Lord, tend my sheep. And he turned right around and asked him again, Peter de Lemon, yeah, Lord, tend my sheep. I said, he must have meant tend my sheep. <laughs> he said it three times, you know. And I said, that's all I'm going to do. And that's all I've done. That's all I've done for 36 years. I've never tried to get anything for me in 36 years. I've never tried to go any place. I don't run my own life for my wife or my kids. And everything's happened. Since I quit trying to run my life and hers and the kids, we've become a family. Since I quit trying to go any place, I've been all over the world. <laughs> and since I quit trying to get something, I got rich. <clears throat> That's what happened to me. And I never tried to bring in anybody about. I just tried to tend the sheep. That's all I've done. And if I'd go ahead, I would tell you that I had probably one of the greatest experiences in the business world that anybody ever had. In my 11th year, I bought the business <coughs> that I was thrown out of. And when I sold it, I was wealthy. And my people made me wealthy. They wanted me to be wealthy. 
Now, you business people in this room, including my friend Ed back there, and he's a whale of a businessman, will know that this couldn't happen. And I'll tell you a little story first. I'm about to quit anyway because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Nobody would give me another cookie or give me a <laughs> cup of coffee or anything else. We have a group at home called the West Cabini Group. It's a big meeting and it's held in a church. And it's about 20 years old. And I've talked at every anniversary they've had. Clancy talks the Saturday before Christmas every year. It's a Saturday night meeting. Clancy, incidentally, claims that I'm his sponsor. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that he asked me to be his sponsor so he could sponsor me. Because <laughs> he's been running my life ever since I said, well, I won't really be your sponsor, but I'll give you anything I've got. <clears throat> but I won't think of you as my baby. So, <clears throat> he takes that as giving him the license to run my life. <laughs> I mean, bad. But anyhow, <clears throat> I was out there last year waiting for him to call the meeting. And a man that I'd done hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of business with, I looked up and he was walking down the center aisle in that place. And he was not alcoholic. <clears throat> I'd known him and done business with him for years and years. And uh, I thought, what in the world's Bob doing here? He's not an alcoholic. So I went out and hugged him a little and told him how much I loved him. I said, Bob, what are you doing here? Well, he says, I was over to see so-and-so, a friend of his and a friend of mine who's a member of this society, this afternoon, and we had a good visit. And uh, I said to him, what, what are you going to do tonight? He said, I'm going to an AA meeting. He says, you know who you're going to listen to? He says, yeah, I'm going to listen to old Chuck C. Because he always talks at our anniversary. Bob says, can I go with you? And here I am. And so I introduced him to the four or five guys that were talking with him there. Bob stood there looking at the floor. And he says, gentlemen, I want to tell you something about this guy. He says, he's the only man I ever did business in my life that I never asked to write down anything. And then he just stopped. And I figured that I ought to say something, you know. <laughs> so I said, that's true, Bob. But it's also true that I never asked you to write down anything, isn't it? And he says, yes. Now, again, you businessmen know better than that. A little deal with me was 25000 because we were in the, the fixture business, market fixtures only. We built them, designed them, built them, installed them. And a little deal with me was 25000 The big one was a quarter of a million. And the whole time I owned that business, I never had a written word. Not a written one. And nobody ever beat me out of a nickel. I'd put in a deal and bill them and they'd pay me. And it was more fun than Dill has pickles. There was just nothing but love and mutual trust. And a lot of people think it can't be done. But they made me wealthy. And they, was tickled, they were tickled to death because they were all wealthy. And they wanted me to be wealthy. And they made me wealthy. And it's a beautiful thing. And I tell you that because of this. <clears throat> I 
I am totally convinced that uh, God don't think more of a salmon than he does of you. And you know that a salmon born at the headwaters of the Klamath River will go down that river when he's about that long and he's liable to have gone clear to Japan and back and right back up that Klamath River where he was born and he spawns and dies. Now I get lost on the freeway <laughs> with a sign every 90 feet. I have to have help in the airport. I suppose if there was just one one line coming in, I'd have to have help because I get lost. <laughs> and here's a salmon goes all the way to Japan and back. And I said to myself, "How you? Uh, I wonder who, whose travel agent is." <laughs> <laughs> so I swam with him in my imagination. And I knew who, he, who his travel agent was. God's idea of a salmon includes everything necessary for its complete fulfillment. Even going to Japan and back. We have another little phenomenon down there where I live. We have the swallows that come back to Cap Capistrano. Every St. Joseph's Day, they show up almost on the second at the uh, first mission that was ever built in California. Right there at San Juan Capistrano. And they winter in Venezuela. Now who do you think is there? Travel agent. And I had to fly with them. And it was obvious that God's idea of a swallow includes everything necessary for its complete fulfillment. Including going to Venezuela and back without any road map. Now this this is a this is a sermon that just carries me clear to the sky. Do you think that God's idea of a salmon or a swallow is more complete than his idea of his kids, you and I? I don't think so. I don't think so. When you and I get simple enough to live as we live in Alcoholics Anonymous, sharing our experience, strength, and hope with anybody that needs us in love, just because we want to, we discover that underneath are the everlasting arms. And it's terrific. It's absolutely terrific. And I learned it from my Blue Jays. You know, my Blue Jays and my, uh, my uh, hummingbirds sit in the same tree. You know? And I've been watching them. I feed them all the time. They break me up in business. <coughs> Peanuts and sugar and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I have never yet heard one of those blue jays say to his partner, look at that so-and-so, he's flying backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fly backwards. Why can't I fly backwards? <laughs> you know. He don't even pay any attention to him. He don't even know he's flying backwards. <laughs> you know why? He don't give a damn. <laughs> he's busy beating himself. <laughs> if I was a blue jay, I'd want to be a hummingbird. <laughs> My bogan bee, I've had it 25 years. And it looks right up at the rose garden. 
And you know that bogan has not decided to be a rose yet. <laughs> it's perfectly happy to be a bogan and it knows how. <laughs> and it knows how. Well, I'd want to be a rose, would you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Everything up to us is perfectly satisfied to be what it is, and it knows how. But we come along and they tell us we've got to improve on God's handiwork. we got to be this, have that, and be no one else before we can live. You know. And we get all involved in trying to self-improve. And a lot of the people in our program thinks this is a self-improvement program. It is not. It's a self-discovery program. And with this, I'm going to quit. You sent me back to New York. The second delegate to the General Service Conference from Southern California. Cliffy Walker was first. And I was the second. And I got to meet all the the old timers. I got to meet the whole bunch back here. Abby and Bill and Bob and their wives and Snyder and the whole bunch, you know. And uh, it was it was a fine experience. Very fine experience. Something I wouldn't trade for anything. At the end of the second conference, <clears throat> you go back for two years, you know. And I was there in 53 and 54. At the end of the conference in 54, Bill sought me out and he says, Chuck, you've been back here two years straight. And you've never taken five seconds of my time. And I think I know why. And it's time for us to become acquainted. And I'm going to come out and see you. Well, Bill lived in Bedford Hills, New York. And I lived in Beverly Hills, California, clear across the cotton. And I, and he was the head man. And here I'm a neophyte. And he's going to come and see me. And I, for a while, I couldn't speak. And what I could, I said, Bill, if you're serious, we got room for you. And we'd love to have you. Now that was in April 1954. In June 54, he was in our house in Beverly Hills. And from then until he died in 1971, Mrs. C and I spent much time with him and Lois and in their house and in ours. And uh, we got to know them quite well. And so quite often I say that our program, our formula for sobriety, is the finest formula that was ever conceived in the mind of man through the grace of God for obtaining and maintaining sobriety. But it has two other facets that are equally miraculous. It's the finest program for the good life and for self-discovery. Not self-improvement, self-discovery. Self that was ever conceived in the mind of man through the grace of God. And this is the reason I say it. <clears throat> Bill was telling me about writing the book, you know. And they had written four chapters. And it was time to write chapter five. With our formula in it. And uh, Bill said he, he had to write. Now the reason he had to write, kids, was that... The book, in its original conception, was to spread the word faster to the drunks than they could do it on a personal basis. But the more they thought about it, the more they thought that it was a money-making scheme, too. And they were all starving to death. They were all meeting around Bill's kitchen stove. And the only one of the bunch that was working was Bill's wife, Lois. <laughs> I 
and she was working in Macy's basement. And uh, they sort of wanted to get her out of that basement. So they were going to make a lot of money off the book. And it's time for him to write chapter 5. And Bill said he sat down and he had absolutely nothing to write. He was totally void. But he had to write. And they wouldn't have a book and he wouldn't have anything to sell and lost it after remaining in the basement. <laughs> so he started to write. There's nothing to write. And in 30 minutes, he came up with the 12 steps. And the 12 steps have never been changed, in essence. There's been a word here and a word there. But the meaning of the 12 steps has never changed in 47 years. And so, that's the reason I say that it's the finest program that was ever conceived in the mind of man through the grace of God. Because these steps came out of where they were. You know, the carpenter man said, I am in the Father, and he in me, and I in you. The carpenter man said, Fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the, meat, give us the kingdom. The carpenter man said, in him we live and move and have our being. And that means to me that you and I are living in the very essence of God right now. When we're open, we get it from where it is. And when we're self-thinking, the doors are closed, and we don't get enough, you know? So, we got the 12 steps out of where they are. The infinite intelligence in which we live. Because, you see, God lives in us, and in all other creatures that live on this planet. I'm particularly impressed with the Hebrew word for God. It's Yahweh. And it means that which is. That which is. And it means all of that which is. And so we're related one to another. And to the everything else that grows. Everything that lives. The birds and the bees. And the beautiful flowers. I was looking at your, your pink dogwood in this town. It's beautiful. I happen to be a Cherokee and got a hunk of it in. They got mixed up over there in the Carolinas and <laughs> forgot that they were Indians and others. So we got all mixed up with the Cherokees. And I've always had this feeling of uh, unity, but I never brought it into conscious awareness until I was through with the business world. But since I've been in, out of the business world, I've taken all my so-called intellectual wisdom and turned it into conscious awareness. And it's fantastic. And it includes the fact that God in me, as me, is me. And God in you, as you, is you. And we can't change it. We can't change it. The carpenter man said it like this. Who, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? Which means we can't change the reality of our own being. We can only change our experience in reality. I sit in the same chair I sat in for 10 years in hell. And now I have 36 years in heaven. In the same chair. Nothing happened to the chair. Nothing happened to the wife. Nothing happened to the kids. Something happened to me. And I moved out of hell into heaven. 
And that's a sermon as long as from here to Mars and back. And it says, son, heaven was always in that chair. You were in hell. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.